okay yeah thank you so much yeah, we are uh, being recorded now um all right so uh, we will now get into uh, the actual john's gospel and uh, we will try to cover as much as we can uh, we may not be able to look into every single verse uh, but we will do our best to try and cover as much as we can in the 50 minutes that are left to us all right so um, getting into john chapter 1 verses 1 to 18 is what we would try to look at today uh, john 1 1 to 18 is one uh, independent section by itself uh, the commentaries would generally refer to this particular uh, passage as the prologue uh, because it's like an intro you know to the rest of the uh, gospel of john and um, many people believe that in fact this was probably like a song which could be sung uh, so they probably had a tune for it and uh, these first 18 verses were probably sung out uh, it, it was a kind of um, you know doctrine in song form uh, because of the way the wordings have been arranged so um, uh, scholars say that probably this prologue was divided into four song stanzas you know so uh, um if yeah i i would just just give me a moment and i will share uh, my screen so that we can look at the first slide just so that you'll have an idea uh yeah i'm uh, hoping that i'm um, visible now um is the slide visible to you all yes ma'am Perfect. Thank yes. you so much. All right. So yeah, as you can see here, uh, the first stanza is probably verses one and two. And then you have a second stanza, which would be verses three to eight. And uh, then you have nine to 13. And of course, then the last stanza. So uh, each stanza uh, focuses on one main point. Okay, So we would try to look at those in greater detail now. Okay, just to stop sharing. All right. So, um, whatever is covered here in these uh, four stanzas, uh, there, are, there are some very important themes that are being touched upon. And then uh, later on, when we uh, get into the rest of the gospel, we see these uh, main things which have been highlighted here, we see them developed in greater detail. So we have some important themes which are getting introduced here in the prologue section, and they uh, are dealt with in a greater uh, detail by John later on in the in the rest of the gospel. So uh, we we see in uh, the first verse uh, that uh, you know he talks about how Christ existed all along right from the beginning he has no beginning he has always existed he has always been there so we see that in verse 1 and later on in chapter 17 the same you know he comes back and touches upon the same uh, idea and uh, in in verse uh, 4 and verse 9 it talks about the light you know uh, he he's described as this light who has entered the world and we see the same uh, theme being touched upon later on uh, in um, chapter 8 and chapter 9 and another important theme which gets touched upon over here is the is the enmity that there is between darkness and light. Uh, so that we see that in verse five uh, in the prologue. And again, the same concept gets touched upon later in chapter three. And uh, another theme that maybe we could uh, you know just uh, refer to right now would be glory. Uh, the the whole concept of glory which is mentioned over here in verse 14 and later on it gets developed in chapter 12. so all of these um themes some very important themes uh, which get which very briefly get referred to over here in the prologue are developed in greater detail later on in the uh, gospel um verses 11 and 12 um kind of uh, lay emphasis on the uh, entire structure of the gospel which you know which we would see later verses 11 and 12 are significant uh, if we can have maybe one person uh, read out verses 11 and 12 of chapter 1 
oh how do i mute a person i need to learn how to do this okay yeah yeah so kishan are you reading out the thing the passage or is someone else doing that uh, verses 11 and 12 if we can have any one person read out chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 and read ma'am yes please john chapter 1 verse 11 and 12 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name amen amen so here we see that um, uh, it talks about how some did not receive him. And if we look at the Gospel of John, chapters 1 to 12, talk about how he uh, approaches a different uh, varieties of audiences. And some of them receive him, and some of them reject, it, uh, reject him. So chapters 1 to 12 focus on that. Uh, they, um, they speak of people who accept it, and they speak of people who uh, did not uh, accept him when we come to the second half of the book uh, which would be chapters 13 to 21 there it talks about how those who received him become part of his flock so uh, they say that verses 11 and 12 of the prologue kind of um, lay down the emphasis of the rest of the gospel so the first 12 chapters talk about people accepting and rejecting. And then in the next uh, latter half, chapters 13 to 21, we see uh, how those who have accepted him, they become part of his flock. And uh, it talks about him uh, teaching them, uh, showing things to them in greater detail, all of those things. So let's come now to uh, the very first stanza which would be verses one and two and uh, to get back into the powerpoint okay uh, so i'm assuming that it's visible on your screens so we're looking at uh, verses one and two where the main emphasis is on uh, logos and uh, god so here he begins by talking about how the word has always existed from before creation. And uh, so uh, the word and God uh, are shown over here as having always existed. Then uh, the second thing that we see over here is that just a minute, just a minute, please. Yeah, um, the, the word that is being used over here, again and again, the Greek word that is used over here is the word E-I-M-I, uh, you know. Um, and uh, over here, the emphasis is on the fact that uh, it, this word, uh, it can be used to talk about something that has always been there. Uh, there's another word which is used uh, in, the, in, the, in the Greek, uh, which is, you know, uh, genomai and uh, that talks about something which has started to exist so there is a beginning to it on the other hand eimi when it is used it can be used in the normal sense of uh, something being there but it, it, it is also used wherever it talks about something which has always been there which never had any beginning it it, it, uh, it talks about the word that this greek word is used to talk about something which has always been in existence so uh, john whenever he uses this uh, word eimi uh, with with uh, regard with regard to jesus 
you know he always uses uses it in this sense of someone who has never been uh, created someone who never ever had a beginning someone who has always been there uh, so we see uh, john using this uh, word eimi in that specific sense so over here in this uh, first stanza uh, we see that uh, the word existed even before creation and um, if we were to compare this john chapter you know this this this, this first two verses john chapter 1 verses 1 to 2 if we were to compare them with genesis 1 over there in genesis 1 you have uh, the creation being talked about here you have some uh, you here you have someone who is busy, being described as existing even before this creation so throughout the prologue uh, we see a kind of comparison being done um, with the book of genesis uh that will become clearer as we go along um if we can uh, look at psalm 33 verses 6 and 9 if we can have one person please read out psalm 33 uh, verses 6 and 9 Can I read? Yes, please. By the word of the Lord were heavens made, and all the host of them, them by the uh, breath of His mouth, He gather gathered the waters of the sea together as as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. So all along, the Jews had this idea in their mind that it was a word that. created uh, you know it was it was by by word that everything was brought into creation they already had that concept and so over here john is uh, telling these jewish people he's speaking to them and he's saying you know you always said that it was through the word that everything was created and now i am telling you that this word is none other than jesus himself so it's not just a spoken word but it's also a living person so uh, john builds on what the jews are already familiar with uh, he takes up an idea which they are, a, a concept which they are already familiar with and he shows them that this word uh, which they always thought of as having done creative uh, activity is none other than actually jesus himself and um, uh, in the um, you know intertestamental period also there are some apocryphal writings you know writings which were written down during that time by different people you know in between the time of the old testament and the time of the new testament there were different people who wrote uh, different things and uh, one of those writings is something called wisdom of solomon this is not one of the biblical uh, books it is just a writing which was written by someone during that time and not by solomon because solomon would have been you know long dead uh, but it is just uh, titled as the wisdom of solomon um the thing about the apocryphal books is that uh, the people would um, name their writings after popular figures of the old testament in the hope that people would consider their work of writing as something important and people would you know uh, read it and and talk about it and uh, its popularity would spread and so uh, they would use the names of famous characters when they are writing their book even though the actual author would be somebody else so one of those apocryphal books which uh, was written during the intertestamental period uh, was the wisdom of solomon and even over there in that uh, wisdom of solomon there are references uh, to the power of god uh, which is at work in the world in the form of a written thing so even in in the intertestamental period there was a kind of awareness that uh, creation came through uh, god's creative spoken activity and so here uh, john is saying or oh, this this kind of creative word that you people have been talking about all along it's not just a spoken word but it's actually a living person so he tries to uh, bring this across to the people right in the prologue right in the beginning itself um and he says that this word was god so it was not just 
uh, word which existed in the presence of God, but it says this word, he was a living person and he is God himself. Okay, so he uses um, this kind of wording over here. Um, what else can we learn from this particular portion? Mm. Okay, maybe we can uh, know, move into the second stanza, uh, which would be verses 3 to 8. Okay, so in the first uh, stanza, the emphasis was, was on how the Logos has existed uh, with God and he is God. Moving to the second stanza, here the emphasis is more on the creation, the creative act. Um, so if we look at verse 3, yeah, if, if maybe we could know, if one of us could just read out verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Um. Ma'am, shall I read it? Yes, please. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. Nothing so, was made that had been made. Yeah. So all things that were created were created through him, which means that he himself was never created. Okay. So it was the created things which were made through him. It, it establishes the fact that he himself was not among those things which were created, among the list of things which were created. He already existed even before those things were created. He already was. So uh, uh, John tries to bring out that uh, specific aspect. Um, so in the first stanza, we saw who the Logos is. He is God. And now in the second stanza, we see what he does. Through the Logos, everything that was made uh, was created. So here in the second stanza, we see what the Logos does. And uh, then coming to verses 4 to 5. Um, uh, maybe we can read out verse 5. Yeah, if, if one of us could read out verse 5, please. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. OK, so um, it's established over here that the darkness cannot defeat or overcome the word. OK, so um, we have an introduction over here of the concept of the enmity that lies between darkness and light. Um, so. Yeah, in um, uh, which version did you read out from brother just now uh, when you read out this particular verse? I was ES ESV. Okay, ESV. Yeah. Um, coming to verses six to eight, uh, if. Um, yeah, if any one of us could just read out six, seven, and eight, and we will look at we we'll look at uh, some of the main things which come out of that portion. Verse there was six. A man sent from, oh, what, ma'am? I'm reading it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Thank you. Yeah. So over here, uh, it's describing uh, a kind of courtroom, uh, you know, wording is used over here, uh, as in someone coming forward as a witness and verifying and saying, uh, you know, this what I'm speaking now is is truth, and they are uh, giving their testimony uh, regarding the identity of Jesus. So over here, John is presented, John the Baptist is presented as a witness, and he verifies uh, the fact that um, uh, Jesus is that Jesus were that Jesus is the uh, you know the, the truth.
All right, let's look at the third stanza, um, where uh, now the emphasis is on revelation, um, the logos and revelation. That would be verses 9 to 13. Uh, if we can just read out verse 9. Uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Ma'am, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Okay, so um, over here, uh, John introduces the word, I uh, you know that world, okay, and uh, that's the Greek word cosmos. And he uses this particular word 78 times in this uh, entire Gospel of John. So for him, this uh, this particular term, uh, he, it contains a certain significance. In most of the places where he uses it, um, he, he tends to give it a slightly negative kind of um, idea and a kind of negative kind of uh, significance. Um, so it says over here, uh, that this true light came into the world and uh, we see that the world was not willing to um, accept it. Uh, if we can just read out verse 10. If one of us could please read out verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Okay, so over here, uh, the first part talks about the physical world, the created world, but then the next portion where it says the world did not you know, accept him, it's talking about people, uh, their responses. So most of the time when John uses this term world, he's talking about the people, not just the created structure, but he's talking about actual people. Uh, and uh, their response to him, and here we see that you know they are rebelling against him. So even though he created them, uh, their response to him is that uh, of rebellion. They do not believe in him. They do not trust him. Uh, and then, if we can look at. Um, verses 12 and 13. If one of us could read out 12 and 13, please. But as many as received him, to them he gave the, the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so um, this probably would have been a very, uh, um, very significant statement to the Jewish people because they always considered themselves as the children of God. But over here, it's being told that uh, um, uh, he has come not just for the people of Israel, but for the entire world. So for the Jewish people, uh, this would have been uh, probably a slightly new concept uh, and uh, uh, because he has not just come for his uh, for the people of Israel but for everyone in the world and um, um, in verse 13 uh, it says that the people would be given the power to become God's children okay so uh, even those who are outside the fold of Israel they too would be given the power to become uh, part of God's family. All right, uh, let's uh, look at the fourth stanza, uh, which is verses 14 to 18. Um, maybe we can, um, we can look at verse 14 first. Yeah, if, if someone can if someone can please read out verse 14. Ma'am, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, 
who came from the father full of grace and truth okay so uh, now this would have been something which would have uh, sounded very strange to the greek people uh, because uh, for them the idea of flesh uh, was something substandard they regarded the spirit as something very divine and uh, something to be uh, you know uh, praised on the other hand they thought of the flesh as something um, not very good as, as something uh, corrupt and uh, so for them this would have been a very shocking and new idea that uh, john is talking about divine godhood choosing to become something as um, uh, imperfect in their eyes you know in their eyes they considered flesh as something uh, very uh, below standard and so it would have come as a surprise to them that this divine god would have been willing to become uh, a human being would have been willing to assume a human flesh you know and be and be willing to come and in, in uh in in the form of a human uh and uh, there's another term that we see over here in this particular verse where it talks about how he came and he dwelt with his people and uh, the word that is used over here um is the word is, is the greek word skenu which talks about uh, you know god living with people and uh, this is the same word which is used even in the uh, greek translation of the old testament that word skenu uh, and it and that particular word is used in exodus chapter 25 verses 8 to 9 and that word is also used in zechariah chapter 2 verse 10 and we are talking about the greek translation of the old testament you know the septuagint because originally the old testament was written in the hebrew language and uh, it was then translated into the um, into the into the greek language and so the greek old testament exodus chapter 25 verses 8 to 9 and zechariah 210 these two uh, uh, in these two places the word skenu the same word which john is using is used over there and we see that over there in the greek old testament it's talking about the tabernacle that word is being used for the tabernacle it literally means that in physical form god comes down and he lives among his people so in the old testament they thought of god dwelling among his people in a uh, in a tent in a tabernacle but over here he comes in a body you know in a in a, in a human body and uh, so for the jews this particular usage of this word over here would have reminded them about the tabernacle and they would have understood that john is trying to say that in the, even though in the olden times the lord had only come to them in the form of a tent now he is coming to them in the form of a actual human uh, person so this particular um, uh, wording would have been very significant to them and what else do we see over here it says uh, you know the last portion if if, if you could you know just uh, read verse 15 once again you know the last portion of yeah if you could just read verse 15 once again john bore witness of him and cried out saying this was he of whom i said he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me okay no i think i seem to have got the wrong verse um just a minute all right i don't seem to have the reference right now uh we'll we'll just move on to verses 16 and 17 yeah um if if we could instead read out 16 and 17 please uh, if one of us could please read out verses 16 and 17 yes ma'am please read please read out thank you ma'am and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through moses but grace and truth came through jesus christ amen all right over here i mean if we were to um, it says in the if, if any, any of you can read out 
um, uh, from the NKJV, if you have that version with you. Does anyone have uh, the NKJV? Because over there, you literally have the literal translation of that uh, verse. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Oh, is that the is that the NKJV? Yes, Pastor. Uh, yeah, I think I have it. And, yeah. and of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, it says grace for grace. And uh, so uh, different translations have tried to explain what that means. Uh, they've uh, because the, the literal translation is literally that it, it just it says uh, grace upon grace grace for grace uh, is has been received and uh, uh, so what does that mean what does that term mean um, in the old testament uh, grace was given through moses so even in the old covenant there was grace uh, because uh, god was choosing to enter into a covenant with human beings and uh, so he was extending grace to them so there was grace even in the old testament and uh, now in the new testament you have a new uh, phase of grace um, something which which is more advanced so there was grace even in the old covenant but over here there is um, a, the niv puts it puts it this way it says out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given okay so it's their attempt at trying to explain that particular phrase uh, in their translation so in the old testament there was already grace given under the old covenant but here now through jesus uh, there is a new kind of grace a new level of uh, grace that is being bestowed upon the people and uh, uh, what is the difference we see that over here uh, this is a grace which uh, which uh, makes people uh, children of God, right? So we saw that in the prologue. We saw it in one of the earlier verses where it talks about how uh, everyone who believes in him will be given the power to become children of God. So even in the Old Testament, uh, those who lived under the Old Covenant and who chose to follow the Lord, uh, they were considered God's children. Uh, but then they had not stepped into the fullness of what of the salvation we know which was promised uh, so they too had to wait until the time of christ's coming uh, and 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 i and, know and, uh, they had to wait until his, his act of crucifixion upon the cross and his resurrection for all of that to be truly completely realized in them so uh, what is the new grace that is being given uh, this new grace is where you are uh, sealed with the holy spirit and so you become a child of god in a in a in a sense uh, in in a deeper sense uh, which was not um, attained earlier you know which which, which is not uh, there uh, which was not available in the old testament so over here it talks about how mercy uh, how 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 grace and truth have now come through jesus christ um, there was truth revealed in the old testament um, there were things that God had revealed to his people in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant of Moses. But now the greater revelation, the more complete revelation has come through Jesus Christ. So it talks about how grace and truth have now come through uh, Jesus Christ. Um, coming to verse 18. Yeah, if, I, if, we, if we could just read out verse 18, please. No, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. Thank you. Okay, so um, in the, um, you know, it's, it's talking about how um, in the previous verse, we looked at how the law was given to Moses, but now grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. And now this verse is talking about how no one has seen the Father except the one who is in the bosom uh, of the Father, uh, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. So uh, there's a kind of subtle reference over here uh, to how Moses, too, had wanted to see God. If you remember in the Old Testament, he says to the Lord, Lord, you know, uh, I wish to see you. Uh, but then 
God says that it's not possible for him to see, and so he only allows uh, him to see his back, even as he just passes by. So uh, over here, uh, John is trying to point out that Moses was indeed a great man. The Lord chose him and used him as the leader through whom uh, God's revelations were revealed. But now someone greater than Moses has, has come over here who uh, has always seen the Father and been in the bosom of the Father. So Moses uh, too is a great leader. But now John says it's time for you to start listening to someone who is greater, someone who has actually seen God with his own eyes, someone who has always been in the presence of God. So the, a greater one has come. So no, so it is wrong to go on clinging on to the old covenant. It is time for the people to start uh, stepping into the new grace and truth, which the fuller revelation, which Jesus is bringing in. So that's the concept that he is trying to uh, present over here. Um, and then uh, what else? Yeah, maybe we can look at one uh, small thing in the PowerPoint. Uh, just a minute. Uh, in if if someone can read out verse eighteen in. Uh, NKJV, please. John one eighteen in NKJV, and another person can read read out the same verse in NIV. NKJV. Verse no one has John. seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. Yeah, and, and then uh, if one, if someone can read it out from NIV. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And um, I'm not too sure whether that's NIV. Uh, anyone else who has the NIV? Yes, ma'am. It is New International Version. I don't know. Okay, maybe it's a it's a different edition, probably. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So no, the point that I wanted to make was, uh, just a minute. Oh, this thing got deleted. I can read just one that. Uh, no one has seen God, but the one and only God. The one, but the one and only Son. Who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Who is himself God is an explanatory uh, thing which they are trying to bring out over there through that particular translation. Uh, because, I mean, uh, yeah, let me just put up the PowerPoint. Um, oh, I need to say share. Okay. Just a moment. Okay, uh, uh, now is this visible on your screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now this is how the wording actually is. I mean, if, this is just Bible Hub, okay? Uh, by, I've just looked at uh, this verse in Bible Hub. And uh, so if you see, uh, the word God is used over there, uh, both for Jesus and the same word is used for uh, the Father as well. Okay, so. Theos is the word. Uh, in in the first portion, we see it as theon because I mean that's just uh, you know the the grammar uh, that's being used over there. But it's actually the same word theos. So the word God, uh, the word theos, is being used over there both for the Father and for Jesus. Uh, the, so uh, NIV tries to explain that in one of its editions where it says who himself was God. Okay, just. Um, so over here, we're not talking about someone at the level of Moses, but now we are talking about someone who is far superior. And so John says, we need to uh, pay attention to this greater person who has now come to us and who is bringing a greater revelation. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. I think the sharing has now stopped. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, so these are just some of the main uh, things that are there in um, in these first eighteen verses. Now, before we go a little further, um, are there any questions, any doubts, anything at all that you want to raise up uh, regarding these first eighteen verses? You could just directly ask or you can type, depending on what you would prefer. Um, no questions of any kind. All right, then uh, we will um, we will close for the day. Uh, but before we do that, um, just uh, you know um, to inform you regarding the assignments and assessments, uh, we would have four of them. The first two would be very simple. Uh, we would just have multiple choice. So you would just have to tick the correct answer. So the first two would be 25 marks each. So 50% of your marks would you know, come in through the first uh, two, two assignments itself. You would have one week's time uh, to go through the questions and you know answer. Uh, the other two assessments uh, would be two weeks duration each. Okay, So you would, you would get two weeks time. Uh, to to cover the, uh, the the assignment from the day of posting, you would have two uh, two weeks time to you know go through it, and um, that would be of a written nature. So you would have to gather some information, and you would have to give a written write up of the uh, assignment. Okay, so uh, uh, that may require a little more effort. Uh, but in the, it'll also give you a chance to you know look up some online resources, consult this and that, and uh, you, you, there would be some um, some level of self learning even as you're doing that. All right. So uh, the and because of that, you would also have more time being given to you. You would have two uh, uh, two weeks time for each of those uh, two assignments. So uh, I don't think um, there would be no exam as such. Okay. So you would, don't have to worry about an exam. So uh, I think it would be quite uh, easy for you to score, uh, you know, in this um, in this particular uh, subject. I don't think there would be any issues regarding that. All right. So um, uh, we will meet again next class. Uh, and um, uh, for this particular class, I had prepared a lot of um, you know notes and a lot of information. And uh, I, I realized that even as I'm going through it, it it's all rather <laughs> very uh, scholarly. So uh, the next time when we have a class, we will do it differently. I will uh, jot it down more in the form of application points so that um, uh, this, what we are looking at, this word of God, will become very real, very personal. Uh, it's something that had not quite occurred to me. And I'm very sorry. I really apologize to all of you. Uh, when I was preparing my notes, it seemed like an excellent thing that I was doing. Uh, but then now when I am actually speaking it out, I was thinking, no, I don't want to talk about this. And I don't want to talk about that. Because it all sounds so abstract. So uh, um, um, please do keep me in your prayers. I would really appreciate that. Uh, because uh, the whole point of doing this is that uh, whatever we are reading should become so real to us. And I was unable to do that today. And it's a mistake which will never take place again uh, because I'm very, uh, I mean, I really want to do a good job. So, uh, uh, yeah, next week we will meet again and uh, we will look at each verse and try to see how that can uh, apply to us, to our lives, to our world. And uh, hopefully, you know, um, we will have a deeper study as, even as we are doing that. So um, thank you so much for uh, being here in the class. And uh, thank you so much for, you know, participating, reading out the verses, helping me out <laughs> uh, when I could not figure out the whole audio thing. So thank you so much. And yeah, God bless until next time.
थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू द क्लास